Okay. Messages. There we go. Uh, in November, uh, I, I get the opportunity to do a little vacation, 10 day trip to Ecuador, uh, three volcanoes, three summits, uh, going for 19,347 feet on the highest one. And Mitch Jessup, who's already climbed one of our drummers, who's already climbed with me in Columbia, Mitch is going with me. I, every time I get back from a trip like this, I have 15, 25 guys say to me, hey man, next time you're going, let me know. And I'm like, okay. And so about six months ago, I put this trip out online and said, anyone who's ever said to me, if you want to go, you got plenty of time to plan it. Let's do it. Uh, Mitch Jessup responded right out of the gate and said, I want to go with you. And so he's going to join me, but because he's joined me in Columbia for, for, for one that was 17,000 feet, he knows the grind. He, he knows the feeling of the altitude sickness. He knows that deep bone cold at 19,000 feet. He's familiar with it. And out of the other 15 or 20 guys that always say, man, let me know, I'll go with you. No one else replied except a couple weeks later, Morgan Jessup, Mitch's sister, said, I want to go to Ecuador with you. And I said, we can make that happen. She said, you think I can do it? Well, she's in the, at the end of spending the last five months as a wrangler and horseback guide in Wyoming, and she knows the mountains well. She knows the rugged terrain. She knows the altitude up to 13,000 feet. Morgan is experienced. She's capable. She is super tough. Uh, but the Andes, with their altitude, to where when you're looking out a plane window, you're looking at one of the, those are both two of the three summits uh, that we're going to attempt. Uh, that would be a new thing for her. The logistics of the ice and snowpack for that type of thing will be something that she'll be able to work through. I'm, I, I've known Morgan since she was born, and I know uh, she is more than capable enough to do this. I'm excited about her and Mitch going out of the dozens of men who always say, let me know, I want to go with you. I got Morgan and Mitch, and I'm super excited about it. There are plenty who would go if they logistically could do it. Nate would go with me, but his wife would kill him. Uh, Zane would go with me in a heartbeat and is probably sitting there jelly right now that he's not going with me, but uh, he's got three little kids, so he's not going to be able to do it. So it's, it's myself, Mitch, and Morgan. But other than the, uh, every country has quirks. So not only dealing with the high altitude stuff in the mountains, there's other quirks when you travel to different countries that you got to be aware of. Like in Colombia, for example, they can only use their car every other day. If you're a car owner, you can only use it every other day of the year. Well, there's several things that I'm going to have to help Morgan and Mitchell understand. Uh, little quirks about Ecuador, and one is they eat guinea pigs as a part of their regular meals in Ecuador. That, that guinea pig for them, like, yeah, the pet guinea pig is a part of their diet, a part of their meal plan, so they're going to get to do that. But the second is what you were seeing on the screen, and that is Ecuador is one of the few countries that uses the greenback as their currency, and here's the catch. When Morgan and Mitch go to Ecuador with me and take cash with them, 50s and $100 bills, large bills are useless. And the reason is the counterfeit 50 and $100 bills are flooding the market that are being made in Colombia by the Cali cartel and other cartels are expanding their criminal enterprise. So the U.S. Treasury puts out videos for countries like Ecuador to tell how if large American bills are real or not. And... And if you have large American bills, the problem is so widespread in Ecuador of counterfeit money that floods in from the cartels in Colombia of American money is that they refuse to accept those larger bills. So if Mitch or Morgan walk into a restaurant or a shop and pull out a $50 bill, even if it would just come straight from the U.S. Mint, it's not going to matter. They're still not going to accept it. They're going to reject it because all of it is suspicious because of the counterfeit bills that are running all throughout the market. Even real American greenbacks aren't accepted. Legitimate bills get caught up in this crossfire of distrust of the counterfeit. So for the American dollar, it's watermarks that you're looking for. Uh, it's security thread. It's raised texture. It's color shifting ink in a couple different places on the bill. And that's how they teach people to spot 
counterfeit American greenbacks. Well, that's one thing they got to learn, but the other is they definitely are going to have to learn how to eat guinea pig, and they're both up for the challenge, and I'm looking forward to a meal of guinea pig with Mitch and Morgan. But they got to understand the fake currency thing, and that's a little bit of what's going on in 2 Peter chapter 2. The scattered believers that we've been talking about are dealing with the same type of counterfeit issue. Among all of the true teaching from the disciples and the pastors and the followers of Jesus, all of the true teaching that is out there, there is counterfeit teaching that is starting to weave its way into the economy of the church and into the life of believers. And just like getting duped on a fake $50 bill, there are followers of Jesus who, who were so faithful to Jesus they had to scatter because of persecution. But even at this point in their life, they're still susceptible to counterfeit teachings. So what 2 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 3 are about, where we'll be this week and next week, is about these false teachers. Now, for those of you who read it this week, you know that Peter spends most of his time pointing out who the false teachers are and how to recognize them because there were all, there were all kinds of false teachers that were infiltrating these churches that were scattered throughout Asia Minor. So he specifically addresses the behaviors, how they act, what they do, that shows that they're false teachers. And in the process of that, he points out things that they're teaching that are false, that are reflected in their behavior. So this morning, we're going to focus just on the security thread, the watermark, the color shifting ink, the things about false teachings that Second Peter is telling these believers to watch out for, the traits that they're looking for to, die, to identify if a teaching is false or not. So, so Peter 2 focuses directly on who those false teachers are and that they're in a lot of trouble uh, from the kingdom of God and from the judgment of God for being false teachers. But what I want to do today is equip us as believers to watch out for how were they supposed to know what the false teachings were. So the first thing that he mentions in chapter 3 verse 16 of 2 Peter is where all of the references are from today. Of chapter 3 verse 16 First is the scripture being twisted. He explains that the false teachers are going to take the scripture that these believers are familiar with and they're going to twist them. They're going to twist the scriptures just enough. They're going to use them, but they're going to twist them just enough to justify their own agenda and what they want to do. They're going to manipulate God's word to fit the narrative that they want to live and that they want to believe. And this is leading people astray. Because these guys are twisting the scripture. So there's a few key questions that we need to ask ourselves. As you're flipping through your YouTube feed and, and listening to different devotionals, as you're surfing the internet and you're reading different devotional blogs and, and people from all over the world are writing devotional blogs and people from, from churches all across the world are giving teachings that we're watching and listening to and, and you feel like something's just not right, these are questions we need to be asking ourselves about what is it they're teaching. Does this teaching align with the broader message of the Bible? Or is this teaching isolated to push a very specific agenda? Is it consistent with God's character as revealed throughout Scripture? Is it, as we've talked about before, is it a descriptive passage? Is it a passage that's telling a story about something that happened and then someone in their devotional blog or someone teaching on YouTube or in your TikTok feed and you get this one minute inspirational message, are they taking something that happened in a descriptive story of the scripture and using it to, to prescribe a behavior for you or a doctrine that you're supposed to believe in? Or is it a passage of Scripture that's found throughout Scripture that is saying, no, as followers of Jesus, these are things that you should be doing. These are things that are prescribed for you. Are those passages being discounted to justify 
an idea, an attitude, or a behavior that the Scripture condemns. Let me give you an example. Ezekiel chapter 4, 12 through 15 is one of my favorite scenes in Scripture between God and humanity. The people of Israel's worship stinks to God. Their worship is going the wrong direction. They're not living out what they've been encouraged to do in the Scripture. So God comes along to the prophet and says, here's what I want you to do. For an extended period of time, I want you to take human dried feces, human dried dung, and I want you to start a fire and I want you to cook your meals over human dung. Because I want people to understand, the people of Israel to see and understand that this is what their worship is like going up my nostrils. Well, that's a, that's a descriptive passage. What God was doing through that prophet for the people of Israel at that time. And if someone took that and said, hey, that happened there in Scripture, so followers of Jesus are supposed to cook all of their meals over dried excrement. That's taking a descriptive passage and turning it into a prescription for followers of Jesus. It'd be totally wrong. It'd be like uh, claiming that when the Apostle Paul tells the, the Ephesians to stop stealing and put their hands to work, to good work, so that they can participate in ministry with the money that they make, that they can serve the poor, that they can do those things. It would be like twisting that which is a prescription throughout Scripture for all of us, and saying, well, you don't have to do that because that was for the Ephesians who were struggling with their work ethic, and that's what that's, and, and then just completely discount it. Uh, the next question we want to ask ourselves is, does the teaching that I'm listening to on TikTok, does the teaching appeal to sinful desires? Peter warns in 2, 18 and 19 that these teachings promise freedom, but instead they actually lead people into corruption. These teachings in one minute clips sound very appealing because they align with our cravings. They give us a pass to say that our emotions and our feelings and our desires are what drive our morality. So if we feel that way and God made us feel that way, then it's okay that that's very appealing to us. That, that any time that the flesh craves greed or lust or power, there are those spiritual influencers that have access to your life and your mind that can make things that the Scriptures very clearly, again, sound very appealing to us. And it's sad because what these people are doing and these teachings are doing is they're taking our human sinful fallen desires and they're taking the Scripture and they're twisting it just enough to make us go, man, that, that, that sounds pretty good. I, I like the way that sounds. I like the freedom that's found in that is to allow my feelings to dictate the morality of my life. But what they're really offering, as Peter says so clearly in those verses on the screen, he's offering them slavery to sin. The very chains that has entrapped us to sin, he's offering us a way out of it. And these false teachings start bending our mind back towards the desires of the flesh. And this so-called freedom is really just slavery to sin. And, and Peter says, this is trapping people in misery. When we don't evaluate what we're reading spiritually, when we don't evaluate what we're listening to, what we're watching, what we're filling our devotional mind with, we're going to be tempted to be drawn away like this. Now, I want to make something very clear. Someone who does not profess to be a follower of Christ well, duh, we shouldn't expect them to be teaching the Scripture in a way or a worldview that we're going to agree with or that we're going to understand at all. This is applying to people who says, I'm a Christian, I follow Jesus, and then you're listening to them or reading them. I'm not, I'm not saying don't read secular authors, don't watch secular YouTube channels, don't listen to teachings. from. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is when you are using someone else's teaching to speak into your life because they claim to be a follower of Jesus, 
They claim to be a Christian. That's where we really want to be asking these questions. Does the teaching undermine Christ's authority? These false teachers were denying the lordship of Jesus. They were distorting the truth of the salvation that Jesus was bringing. They were very subtly outright rejecting that Jesus was the divine authority that brings about salvation for all people. They were doing it just a little bit, and we run into this in the life of Christian teaching throughout our country on a regular basis. Oh, yes, Jesus, but and. Yes, Jesus, but and. And the Scripture is very clear. And this is what Peter's saying. Salvation is comes through the authority of Christ working in your life and it does not come any other way. It doesn't come through your works. It doesn't come through any other belief system. It doesn't come through any other false prophet. Any teaching that adds something to the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and your faith in that for your salvation, what Jesus did on the cross we, I see it on a regular basis from Christian teachers who start adding an and to the work of Christ's authority and the role of our salvation. And the second you see that, you want to know, Peter told you, that's a false teaching coming from a false teacher. Anytime we minimize Christ's role or add something to it, it's a clear sign. Unfollow. Unsubscribe. Turn off. Close. It's clearly off track for Peter. And then the fourth question we want to ask is, does this teaching mock Christ's return? In chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, it says scoffers are going to deny the reality of the future coming of Christ. And in our naturalistic world, in our media that is dominated by naturalism, in our media that is dominated by the rejection of the supernatural altogether, the, the concept of us believing in the return of Christ is ridiculed, is made fun of, it's irrational, it's not naturalistic, it's not scientific in their mind. So they reject it altogether. And, and this worldview, even for those scattered believers who are being persecuted, this was a risk for them. Because these false teachers were doing a little bit of the same thing, and they were, they were putting off, making light of, mocking the return of Jesus. And this leads people astray all the time. It, it does the kind of thing that you don't want to do in the middle of a game. Anytime you're playing uh, softball, or baseball, or tennis, or pickleball, or anything like that, where do you want to be? Someone tell me the body position. You're waiting for the ball to come in play, and it's about to. What do you do? Out loud, say it. Huh? Square up. Yeah. Bend the knees. Where's your weight go? On the balls of your feet. Yep, you get forward. You get those heels off the ground a little bit. You get bouncing around like this. And if you watch enough TikToks and, and, and YouTube reels and Instagram reels of people from naturalistic worldviews, that are inundated with that, and they're mocking the return of Christ. And Peter's saying, hey, you're going to die either way. You need to be ready for this. And he's telling these believers to be, be ready for what's going on. And, and these teachings tend to make us as Christians kind of roll back on our heels a little bit. Stop squaring up. Stand on a locked leg. Put our hands on our hips. And as Christians, we're, we're just like this. And we're not ready, and that's exactly what he's warning us of. And it's such an important question to ask. When teachings dismiss Christ's return, they downplay the reality of divine justice and encourage a life focused solely on the here and now. How much of what we see and hear from time to time is trying to bring our focus and attention to our life this week? How much? A lot of it. Unless you're diving into blogs that you know are not false teachers because 
They go the way of Scripture and they answer to all these questions. If you're following preachers and churches on your Instagram reels that say very inspiring things when they clip 45 seconds out of their sermon and you're watching those for your daily devotions, I, what I've discovered is a majority of those clips are asking you to focus on the here and now and what God can do for you this week. That's what those reels are, are the majority of them are saying to you. What's God going to do for you this week so you can have success and joy and celebration this week and have victory this week? But the entire time, the life and ministry of Jesus is saying, no, our, our focus is on the kingdom of God this week. Not what can Jesus do for me, but what can Jesus do through me this week? So anytime you see those clips that are just always 100% trying to get you excited about what God's going to do for you this week, unfollow. Follow someone who will give you about 20% of that because it is true and we do need it and God does care about your week and he does care about your job and he does care about your house and your cul-de-sac and your apartment complex and what's going on there this week. But he's more concerned about what he wants to do through you in all of those places and make sure you follow authors and books and teachers that are asking you, what is Christ going to do through you? That's where the powerful teaching comes from. So these subtle distortions of the truth and, and Peter's warning about the false teachers and we're looking at the false teachings today are more relevant than ever, ever because this world is filled with all kinds of subtle distortions and it's coming at us about, I don't know, maybe 18, 19 hours a day. We're, we're turning on stuff, we're opening stuff, we're watching stuff, we're listening to stuff as we're driving. And all day, every day, these subtle distortions are out there asking to grab our attention, asking whatever works for you. Here's what the shift looks like. It, it creates a perfect breeding ground for false teachings. Where the truth of the gospel starts getting lost and personal interpretations and Bible studies start out with people, or not at New Start, but Bible studies start out with things like, oh, let's read this passage together and go around the circle and say, what does it mean to me? What does this passage mean to you this week? No, that's not how you arrive at the truth. You read the passage and say, what did it mean to these first readers and how does it apply to my life this week and what God is wanting to do through me for me to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. What is this scripture? How does it apply to my life? Not what does it mean to my life? So this is how we can know that some of us get caught up in these distortions of truth that Peter's talking about. When we defend our faith and share our testimony solely on the practical applications of our life. If over the last year you've not found yourself talking to someone who is spiritually lost in a loving, ongoing relationship to where they know you and you know them and you don't find yourself talking about Jesus and what He means to you, but you only find yourself talking about, oh man, we got a great sports program. Your faith is practicality. Oh, what, what my faith has done for my family. Well, yeah, that's true. That's something to talk about. That's one thing. But these subtle distortions are creeping into our lives that anytime we find ourselves talking to people about the value of being a follower of Christ, we talk solely about what God has done for me in the here and now and the practical application of my life. Man, I just feel better for the week when I go to church. Well, I hope you do, but to be honest, God doesn't care whether you feel better or not or spend the week convicted by what He said through His Word. He wants you to grow in Christ's likeness as we talked about last week. And we begin to lose sight of the core truth of Scripture and Jesus Christ. It becomes whatever feels right mindset. And it opens the door to false teaching in our lives. It becomes less important. It reduces our faith to how we feel. So we find ourselves talking to other believers about, man, I'm just really struggling in my faith. I haven't been feeling it. Struggling in my faith. 
I haven't been feeling it. Well, that's because your focus is to be on the core truth of the gospel and who Jesus is and what he's doing in his grace and what he's done for you. That's where our focus wants to be. So we take the real promises of God, strip them out of context, and lead people astray in 60-second clips. So stay rooted in Scripture. Know it. Understand it. Don't be fooled by those who present a different story. And the only way you can know that and know the answer to those questions on the screen is for you to stay rooted in a life group. For you to stay rooted and committed, not to 17 times a year of sitting under the teaching of God's Word as a part of His body, but 45 times a year, 40 times a year, 50 times a year, just saying, I'm a part of this community and I want to sit under the teaching of God's Word that's being brought to me. I, I, I need to hear it. I need to submit myself to that authority. I need to stay in Scripture reading. One of the things that Nate and I are working on for next year that we haven't had the opportunity to do in a few years, is we're going to do a challenge for those of you who want to, to read through the Bible in a year, in 2025. And we're going to walk through that together as a church for, for those who want to do that because we need to be grounded in Scripture. Is the Scripture being twisted? False teachings. Does the teaching appeal to sinful desires? Does the teaching undermine Christ's authority? Does the teaching mock the idea of Christ's return? We are a church that wholeheartedly is founded on the teaching of Scripture and prayer, and we believe in God's Word, and we believe in what He wants to do through us, through our prayer life, and that is where it all begins. The privilege and the responsibility is never lost on Nate or myself of the, of the responsibility that we have for teaching God's Word to us as a large group. It's not lost on us, and we, we love the privilege of being able to do that. But it's really only valuable if your life is also in God's Word, so you can always double-check anything that's being taught in your life group, that you can always double-check anything that's being taught from the pulpit, because you need to know how to spot false currency. And Morgan and Mitchell are going to need to know that. What's the watermarks look like? What's the security thread look like? What's the raised texture look like? What's the color shifting ink look like? And for us, it's those questions on the screen. But the one that I thought all of you would want to know this morning as the band comes is when Morgan and Mitchell and I sit down at a restaurant in Ecuador as the band comes, One of the things that is, I knew you guys would want to know this because I've had guinea pig uh, when I was in Ecuador before, that Morgan and Mitch are going to want to make sure of is that they're not being served something that's not guinea pig. So I put a little list together for them and for you of how to know you're not eating squirrel or rat or rabbit or something like that. Uh, guinea pigs are smaller and rounder and they have shorter limbs and no visible tail when they're cooked and laying there on your plate, unlike rabbit or squirrel, where the tail will be obvious. And guinea pig is served as the entire whole guinea pig with the skin on it. So you should see a layer of crisp skin over the guinea pig, and, and the skin is, is actually pretty rich in flavor. It's closer to dark poultry, and where for those of you who eat a lot of rabbit, you know it tastes a little bit more like whiter chicken than darker, darker chicken. So Morgan and Mitchell need to remember to be able to spot counterfeit guinea pig. No tail, a little rounder, and a flavor that will remind them that they are not eating chicken. And yes, in November, we will post on all three of our social medias us eating guinea pig so that we can know the difference in false teachings and fake teachings. Amen? Let's stand and worship together.